Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight, three stories by Algernon Blackwood. The South Wind, The Messenger, and The Attic. The South Wind. It is impossible to say through which sense, or combination of senses, I knew that someone was approaching, was already near, but most probably it was the deep underlying mother sense, including them all, that conveyed the delicate warning. At any rate, the scene-shifters of my moods knew it, too, for very swiftly they prepared the stage, then, ever soft-footed and invisible, stood aside to wait. As I went down the village street on my way to bed after midnight, the high alpine valley lay silent in its frozen stillness. For days it had now lain thus, even the mouths of its cataracts stopped with ice, and for days, too, the dry, tight cold, had drawn up the nerves of the humans in it to a sharp that at last began to call for the gentler comfort of relaxation. The key had been a little too high, the inner tautness too prolonged. The tension of that implacable northeast wind, the beast noir, had drawn its twisted wires too long through our very entrails. We all sighed for some loosening of the bands, the comforting touch of something damp, soft, less penetratingly acute. And now, as I turned, midway in the little journey from the inn to my room above La Post, this sudden warning that someone was approaching repeated its silent wireless message, and I paused to listen and watch. Yet at first I searched in vain. The village street lay empty, a white ribbon between the black walls of the big-roofed chalets. There were no lights in any of the houses. The hotels stood gaunt and ugly, with their myriad shuttered windows, and the church, topped by the crown of Savoy in stone, was so engulfed by the shadows of the mountains that it seemed almost a part of them. Beyond reared the immense buttresses of the Dent du Midi, terrible and stalwart against the sky, their feet resting among the crowding pines, their streaked precipices tilting up at violent angles toward the stars. The bands of snow, belting their enormous banks, stretched for miles, faintly gleaming like Saturn's rings. To the right I could just make out the pinnacles of the dense blanches, cruelly pointed. And, still farther, the Dent du Bonobo, as of iron and crystal, running up its gaunt and dreadful pyramid into relentless depths of night. Everywhere in the hard, black sparkling air was the rigid spell of winter. It seemed as if this valley could never melt again, never know currents of warm wind, never taste the sun, nor yield its million flowers. And now, dipped down behind me out of the reaches of the darkness, the newcomer moved close, heralded by this subtle yet compelling admonition that had arrested me in my very tracks. For, just as I turned in at the door, kicking the crunched snow from my boots against the granite step, I knew that, from the heart of all this tightly frozen winter's night, the someone whose message had traveled so delicately in advance was now, quite suddenly, at my very heels. And while my eyes lifted to sift their way between the darkness and the snow, I became aware that it was already coming down the village street. It ran on feathered feet, pressing close against the enclosing walls, yet at the same time spreading from side to side, brushing the window panes, rustling against the doors, and even including the shingled roofs in its enveloping advent. It came, too, against the wind. It flew up close and past me, very faintly singing, running down between the chalets and the church, very swift, very soft, neither man nor animal, neither woman, girl, nor child, turning the corner of the snowy road beyond the curé's house with a rushing, cantering motion, that made me think of a body of water, something of fluid and generous shape, too mighty to be confined in common forms. And as it passed me, it touched me, touched me through all skin and flesh upon the naked nerves, loosening, relieving, setting free the congealed sources of life which the vice had so long mercilessly bound, so that magic currents, flowing and released, washed down all the secret byways of the spirit and flooded again with the full tide into a thousand dried-up cisterns of the heart. 
The thrill I experienced is quite incommunicable in words. I ran upstairs and opened all my windows wide, knowing that soon the messenger would arrive with a million others, only to find that it already had been there before me. Its taste was in the air, fragrant and alive, in my very mouth, and all the currents of the inner life ran sweet again and full. Nothing in the whole village was quite the same as it had been before. The deeply slumbering peasants, even behind their shuttered windows and barred doors, the curé, the servants at the inn, the consumptive man opposite, and the children in the house behind the church. The horde of tourists in the caravansary all knew, more or less, according to the delicacy of their receiving apparatus, that something charged with fresh and living force had swept on viewless feet down the village street, passed noiselessly between the cracks of doors and windows, touched nerves and eyelids, and set them free. In response to the great order of release that the messenger had left everywhere behind her, even the dreams of the sleepers had shifted into softer and more flowing keys. And the valley, the valley also knew, for, as I watched from my window, something loosened about the trees and stones and boulders, about the massed snows on the great slopes, about the roots of the hanging icicles that fringed and sheeted the dark cliffs, and down in the deepest beds of the killed and silent streams. Far overhead, across those desolate bleak shoulders of the mountains, ran some sudden softness like the rush of awakening life, and was gone. A touch, lieth yet dewy, as of silk and water mixed, dropped softly over all, and, silently, without resistance, the bisnoir, utterly routed, went back to the icy caverns of the north and east, where it sleeps, hated of men, and dreams its keen black dreams of death and desolation. And some five hours later, when I woke and looked towards the sunrise, I saw those strips of pearly gray, just tinged with red, the messenger had been to summon, charged with the warm moisture that brings relief. On the wings of a rising south wind they came down hurriedly to cap the mountains and to unbind the captive forces of life, then moved with flying streamers up our own valley, sponging from the thirsty woods their richest perfume. And farther down, in soft, wet fields, stood the leafless poplars, with little pools of water gemming the grass between, and pouring their musical overflow through the runnels of dark and sodden leaves to join the rapidly increasing torrents descending from the mountains. For across the entire valley ran magically that sweet and welcome message of relief which Job knew when he put the whole delicious tenderness and passion of it into less than a dozen words. He comforteth the earth with the south wind. The End The Messenger I have never been afraid of ghostly things, attracted rather with a curious live interest, though it is always out of doors that strange presences get nearest to me, and in nature I have encountered warnings, messages, presentments, and the like, that, by way of help or guidance, have later justified themselves. I have, therefore, welcomed them. But in the little rooms of houses things of much value rarely come, for the thick air chokes the wires, as it were, or distorts or mutilates the clear delivery. But the other night, here in the carpenter's house, where my attic windows beckon to the mountains and the woods, I woke with the uncomfortably strong suggestion that something was on the way, and that I was not ready. It came along the byways of deep sleep. I woke abruptly, alarmed before I was even properly awake. Something was approaching with great swiftness, and I was unprepared. Across the lake there were faint signs of color behind the distant Alps, but terraces of mist still lay gray above the vineyards, and the slim poplar, whose tip was level with my face, no more than rustled in the wind of dawn. A shiver, not brought to me by any wind, ran through my nerves, for I knew with a certainty no arguing could lessen nor dispel that something from immensely far away was deliberately now approaching me. The touch of wonder in advance of it was truly awful. Its splendor, size, and grandeur belonged to conditions I had surely never known. 
It came through empty spaces from another world. While I lay asleep, it had been already on the way. I stood there a moment, seeking for some outward sign that might betray its nature. The last stars were fading in the northern sky, and blue and dim lay the whole long line of the Jura, cloaked beneath still slumbering forests. There was a rumbling of a distant train. Now and then a dog barked in some outlying farm. The night was up and walking, though as yet she moved but slowly from the sky. Shadows still draped the world, and the warning that had reached me first in sleep rushed through my tingling nerves once more with a certainty not far removed from shock. Something from another world was drawing every minute nearer, with a speed that made me tremble and half breathless. It would presently arrive. It would stand close beside me and look straight into my face, into these very eyes that searched the mist and shadow for an outward sign. It would gaze intimately with a message brought for me alone. But into these narrow walls it could only come with difficulty. The message would be maimed. There still was time for preparation. And I hurried into clothes and made my way downstairs and out into the open air. Thus, at first, by climbing fast, I kept ahead of it. And soon the village lay beneath me in its nest of shadow, and the limestone ridges far above dropped nearer. But the awe and terrible deep wonder did not go. Along these mountain paths, whose every inch was so intimate that I could follow them even in the dark, this sense of breaking grandeur clung to my footsteps, keeping close. Nothing upon the earth, familiar, friendly, well-known little earth, could have brought this sense that pressed upon the edges of true reverence. It was the awareness that some speeding messenger from spaces far, far beyond the world would presently stand close and touch me, would gaze into my little human eyes, would leave its messages of life or death, and then depart upon its fearful way again. It was this that conveyed the feeling of apprehension that went with me. And instinctively, while rising higher and higher, I chose the darkest and most sheltered way. I sought the protection of the trees and ran into the deepest vaults of the forest. The moss was soaking wet beneath my feet, and the thousand tapering spires of the pines dipped upwards into a sky already brightening with palest gold and crimson. There was a whispering and rustling overhead as the trees, who know everything before it comes, announced to one another that the thing I sought to hide from was already very, very near. Plunging deeper into the woods to hide, this detail of sure knowledge followed me and laughed, that the speed of this august arrival was one which made the greatest speed I ever dreamed of a mere standing still. I hid myself where possible in the darkness that was growing every minute more rare. The air was sharp and exquisitely fresh. I heard birds calling. The low, wet branches kissed my face and hair. A sense of glad relief came over me that I had left the closeness of the little attic chamber and that I should eventually meet this huge newcomer in the wide, free spaces of the mountains. There must be room where I could hold myself unmanacled to meet it. The village lay far beneath me, a patch of smoke and mist and soft red-brown roofs among the vineyards. And then my gaze turned upwards, and through a rift in the close-wrought ceiling of the trees, I saw the clearness of the open sky. A strip of cloud ran through it, carrying off the night's last little dream. And down into my heart dropped instantly that cold breath of awe I have known but once in life, when staring through the stupendous mouth within the Milky Way, that opening into the outer spaces of eternal darkness, unlit by any single star, men call the coal hole. The futility of escape then took me bodily, and I renounced all further flight. From this speeding messenger there was no hiding possible. His splendid shoulders already brushed the sky. I heard the rushing of his awful wings. Yet in that deep, significant silence with which light steps upon the clouds of morning. And simultaneously I left the woods behind me and stood upon a naked ridge of rock that all night long had watched the stars. Then terror passed away like magic. Cool winds from the valleys bore me up. 
and heard the tinkling of a thousand cowbells from pastures far below in a score of hidden valleys. The cold departed, and with it every trace of little fears. My eyes seemed for an instant blinded, and I knew that deep sense of joy which seems so unearthly that it almost stains the sight with the veil of tears. The soul sank to her knees in prayer and worship, for the messenger from another world had come. He stood beside me on that dizzy ledge, warmth clothed me, and I knew myself akin to deity. He stood there, gazing straight into my little human eyes. He touched me everywhere. Above the distant Alps, the sun came up. His eyes looked close into my own. The End The Attic The forest-girdled village upon the Jura slopes slept soundly, although it was not yet many minutes after ten o'clock. The clang of the Kuverfu had indeed just ceased. Its notes swept far into the woods by a wind that shook the mountains. This wind now rushed down the deserted street. It howled about the old rambling building called the Citadel, whose roof towered gaunt and humped above the smaller houses, chateau left unfinished long ago by Lord Wemyss, the exiled Jacobite. The families who occupied the various apartments listened to the storm and felt the building tremble. It's the mountain wind. It will bring the snow, the mother said, without looking up from her knitting. And how sad it sounds. But it was not the wind that brought sadness as we sat around the open fire of peat. It was the wind of memories. The lamplight slanted along the narrow room towards the table, where breakfast things lay ready for the morning. The double windows were fastened. At the far end stood a door ajar, and on the other side of it the two elder children lay asleep in the big bed. But beside the window was a smaller, unused bed that had been empty now a year and tonight was the anniversary. And so the wind brought sadness and long thoughts. The little chap that used to lie there was already twelve months gone, far, far beyond the hole where the winds came from, as he called it. Yet it seemed only yesterday that I went to tell him a tuck-up story, to stroke Raquette, the old motherly cat that cuddled against his back and laid a paw beside his pillow like a human being, and to hear his funny little earnest whisper say, Uncle, to say, je prie portavelle, for la citadel had its unhappy ghost, a petrival, the usurer, who had hanged himself in the attic a century gone by, and was known to walk its dreary corridors in search of peace. And this wise Irish mother, calming the boy's fears with wisdom, had told him, if you pray for petrival, you'll save his soul and make him happy, and he'll only love you. And thereafter, this little imaginative boy had done so every night. With a passionate seriousness he did it. He had wonderful, delicate ways like that. In all our hearts he made his fairy nests of wonder. In my own, I know, he lay closer than any joy imaginable with his big blue eyes, his queer, soft questionings, his splendid child's unselfishness, a sun-kissed flower of innocence that, had he lived, might have sweetened half a world. Let's put more peat on, the mother said, as a handful of rain like stones came flinging against the windows. That must be hail. And she went on to tiptoe to the inner room. They're sleeping like two puddings, she whispered, coming presently back, but it struck me she had taken longer than to notice merely that. And her face wore an odd expression that made me uncomfortable. I thought she was somehow just about to laugh or cry. By the table, a second she hesitated. I caught the flash of indecision as it passed. Pan, she said suddenly. It was a nickname, stolen from my tuck-up stories he had given me. I wonder how Raquet got in. She looked hard at me. It wasn't you, was it? For we never let her come at night since he had gone. It was too poignant. The beastie always went cuddling and nestling into that empty bed. But this time it was not my doing, and I offered plausible explanations. But she's on the bed. Pan, would you be so kind? She left the sentence unfinished, but I easily understood, for a lump had somehow risen in my own throat too, and I remembered now that she had come out from the inner room so quickly, with a kind of hurried rush almost. I, I put Mariquette out into the corridor. 
A lamp stood on the chair outside the door of another occupant further down, and I urged her gently towards it. She turned and looked at me, straight up into my face. But, instead of going down as I suggested, she went slowly in the opposite direction. She stepped softly towards a door in the wall that led up broken stairs into the attics. There she sat down and waited. And so I left her and came back hastily to the peat fire and companionship. The wind rushed in behind me and slammed the door. And we talked then somewhat busily of cheerful things, of the children's futures, the excellence of the cheap Swiss schools, of Christmas presents, skiing, snow, tobogganing. I led the talk away from mournfulness, and when these subjects were exhausted, I told stories of my own adventures in distant parts of the world, but Mother listened the whole time, not to me. Her thoughts were all elsewhere, and her air of intently, secretly listening bordered, I felt, upon the uncanny, for she often stopped her knitting and sat with her eyes fixed upon the air before her. She stared blankly at the wall, her head slightly on one side, her figure tense, attention strained elsewhere. Or, when my talk positively demanded it, her nod was oddly mechanical, and her eyes looked through and past me. The wind continued very loud and roaring, but the fire glowed, the room was warm and cozy. Yet she shivered, and when I drew attention to it, her reply, I do feel cold, but I didn't know I shivered, was given as though she spoke across the air to someone else. But what impressed me even more uncomfortably were her repeated questions about Raquette. When a pause in my tales permitted, she would look up with, I wonder where Raquette went, or, thinking of the inclement night, I hope Mayor Raquette is not out of doors. Perhaps Madame Favre has taken her in. I offered to go and see. Indeed, I was already halfway across the room when there came the heavy bang at the door that rooted me to the ground where I stood. It was not wind. It was something alive that made it rattle. There was a second blow. A thud on the corridor boards followed, and then a high, odd voice that at first was as human as the cry of a child. It is undeniable that we both started, and for myself, I can answer truthfully that a chill ran down my spine. But what frightened me more than the sudden noise and the eerie cry was the way Mother supplied the immediate explanation. From behind the words, It's only Raquette, she sometimes springs at the door like that, perhaps we'd better let her in, was a certain touch of uncanny quiet that made me feel she had known the cat would come, and knew also why she came. One cannot explain such impressions further. They leave their vital touch, then go their way. Into the little room, however, in that moment there came between us this uncomfortable sense that the night held other purposes than our own, and that my companion was aware of them. There was something going on far, far removed from the routine of life as we were accustomed to it. Moreover, our usual routine was the eddy, while this was the mainstream. It felt big, I mean. And so it was that the entrance of the familiar, friendly creature brought this thing both itself and mother knew, but whereof I, as yet, was ignorant. I held the door wide. The draft rushed through behind her and sent a shower of sparks about the fireplace. The lamp flickered and gave a little gulp, and Raquette marched slowly past, with all the impressive dignity of her kind, towards the other door that stood ajar. Turning the corner like a shadow, she disappeared into the room where the two children slept. We heard the soft thud with which she leaped upon the bed. Then, in the lull of the wind, she came back again and sat on the oilcloth, staring into Mother's face. She mewed and put a paw out, drawing the black dress softly with half-opened claws. It was all so horribly suggestive and pathetic. It revived such poignant memories that I got up impulsively. I think I had actually said the words, We'd better put her out, Mother, after all when my companion rose to her feet and o'erstalled me. She said another thing instead. It took my breath away to hear it. She wants us to go with her. Pan, will you come too? The surprise on my face must have asked a question, for I do not remember saying anything. To the attic, she said quietly. She stood there by the table, 
a tall, grave figure dressed in black, and her face above the lampshade caught the full glare of light. Its expression positively stiffened me. She seemed so secure in her singular purpose, and her familiar appearance had so oddly given place to something wholly strange to me. She looked like another person, almost with the unwelcome transformation of the sleepwalker about her. Cold came over me as I watched her, for I remembered slowly her Irish second sight, her story years ago of meeting a figure on the attic stairs, the figure of Petrival, and the idea of this motherly, sedate, and wholesome woman, absorbed day and night in prosaic domestic duties, and yet seeing things, touched the incongruous almost to the point of alarm. It was so distressingly convincing. And yet she knew quite well that I would come. Indeed, following the excited animal, she was already by the door, and a moment later, still without answering or protesting, I was with them in the drafty corridor. There was something inevitable in her manner that made it impossible to refuse. She took the lamp from its nail on the wall, and following our four-footed guide, who ran with obvious pleasure just in front, she opened the door into the courtyard. The wind nearly put the lamp out, but a minute later we were safe inside the passage that led up flights of creaky wooden stairs towards the world of tenantless attics overhead. And I shall never forget the way the excited Riquette first stood up, and put her paws upon the various doors, trotted ahead, turned back to watch us coming, and then finally sat down and waited on the threshold of the empty, raftered space that occupied the entire length of the building beneath the roof, for her manner was more that of an intelligent dog than of a cat, and sometimes more like that of a human mind than either. We had come up without a single word. The howling of the wind as we rose higher was like the roar of artillery, there were many broken stairs, and the narrow way was full of twists and turnings. It was a dreadful journey. I felt eyes watching us from all the yawning spaces of the darkness, and the noise of the storm smothered footsteps everywhere. Troops of shadows kept us company, but it was on the threshold of this big chief attic, when Mother stopped abruptly to put down the lamp, that a real fear took hold of me for Raquette marched steadily forward into the middle of the dusty flooring, picking her way among the fallen tiles and mortar, as though she went towards someone. She purred loudly and uttered little cries of excited pleasure. Her tail went up in the air, and she lowered her head with the unmistakable intention of being stroked. Her lips opened and shut. Her green eyes smiled. She was being stroked. It was an unforgettable performance. I would rather have witnessed an execution or a murder than watch that mysterious creature twist and turn about in the way she did. Her magnified shadow was as large as a pony on the floor and rafters. I wanted to hide the whole thing by extinguishing the lamp, for, even before the mysterious action began, I experienced the sudden rush of conviction that others besides ourselves were in this attic, and standing very close to us indeed. And although there was ice in my blood, there was also a strange swelling of the heart that only love and tenderness could bring. But whatever it was, my human companion, still silent, knew and understood. She saw, and her soft whispers that ran with the wind among the rafters, il prie pour petrable et la Dubois du la entendu, did not amaze me one quarter as much as the expression I then caught upon her radiant face. Tears ran down the cheeks, but they were tears of happiness. Her whole figure seemed lit up. She opened her arms, picture of great motherhood, proud, blessed, and tender beyond words. I thought she was going to fall, for she took quick steps forward. But when I moved to catch her, she drew me aside instead, with a sudden gesture that brought fear back in the place of wonder. Let them pass, she whispered grandly. Pan, don't you see? He's leading him into peace and safety, by the hand. And her joy seemed to kill the shadows and fill the entire attic with white light. Then, almost simultaneously with her words, she swayed. I was in time to catch her, but as I did so, across the very spot where we had just been standing, two figures, I swear, went past us like a flood of light. There was a moment next that I did not see what happened to Riquette, 
for the sight of my companion kneeling on the dusty boards and praying with a curious sort of passionate happiness, while tears pressed between her covering fingers, the strange wonder of this may be utterly oblivious to minor details. We were sitting around the peat again, we were sitting around the peat fire again, and mother, and mother was saying to me in the gentlest, tenderest whisper I ever heard from human lips, Pan, I think perhaps that's why God took him. And when a little later we went in to make Raquette cozy in the empty bed, ever since kept sacred to her use, the mournfulness had lifted, and in the place of resignation was proud peace and joy that knew no longer sad or selfish questionings. The end.